And now today's word at the Key Church. My message this morning is the people are thirsty and there is no water. I'm telling you folks, this country needs a spiritual downpour. There's many people that are thirsty and there is no water. I'm hungry for more of God. Right now, we are pressing into God, but we haven't yet seen the reign of God by the Spirit upon this nation, and it's what I'm trusting God for. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 4, <coughs> And did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So this is a New Testament scripture speaking about a rock in the Old Testament that followed the Israelites for 40 years through the desert. Have you ever heard of a rock following you? That's quite unusual, guys. And, and, but the New Testament confirms it. Here it is in the New Testament. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Isn't that incredible? That right going back into the Old Testament, here was this rock that was following people, and it was a, at the very least a type of Christ, okay? Because the New Testament says it was Christ. So today, uh, in today's sermon, I mostly want to focus on the role that Miriam played um, and the rock that followed them. So... Who was Miriam, you might ask? She was the big sister to Moses. You all knew that? Everybody knew that? Who can tell me who's another Miriam in the Bible? Not my wife. Anybody else know another Miriam in the Bible? Ah, there we go. She knows her Bible. Another Miriam was the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Her proper Hebrew name was Miriam. But just like the King James Royal English Bible, they anglicized Jesus' name, it was Yeshua. But they, you know, English people, they can't speak Hebrew, so Yeshua doesn't sound like a comfortable word to them. So they said, okay, we'll call him Jesus. And Jesus, if he had to walk past you on this earth and you said Jesus to him, except that he was God and he knew everything and he would have known that you're talking to him. Otherwise, in the natural, if you called him Jesus, he wouldn't have known what you're talking about. And Mary, if you walked past Mary and you said, Hi Mary, she'll just walk right on and think, oh, there must, uh, Is there somebody else here? Who is Mary? So we got a new domestic worker uh, in the week or a week or so ago, and uh, she has a Congolese name, and it's her name is Awful. Uh, but now I'm perhaps not pronouncing it exactly right. Forgive me for that. Her surname is Anance, okay? And I know it's not politically correct, but I cannot call her Awful. Can you imagine me walking around the house? Awful! Awful! Um, so we anglicized her name. And, and it's not exactly awful, but it's so close to awful that we can't get it anything but awful. So we anglicized her name, and we called her Anne. And so now we walk around, Anne, where are you? Lord, forgive us. It's like somebody uh, struggling with the name Nicholas and saying, don't worry, we'll just call you Pit, you know, <laughs> Pit Pompis. It's not nice, I get it, but what other can I do? My Congolese is not so good, and I can't pronounce her name exactly like the Congolese, and the, Engl the closest English word is awful. So, it's a problem. So, Miriam, in the Bible, had a lot to do with water. So, how can you say that? She lived next to the Nile because, remember, she was watching her brother that she put in the Nile, okay? And the Nile, for those of you that have been to the Nile, it's a huge river. It's like bigger than, the, uh, than a lake, man. It's, 
It's like a flowing lake. It's an incredible river. I've sailed on it a few times and what a privilege it is to just see so much water. And so Miriam sang a victory song when God opened the Red Sea. That's the next time that she had to do with, uh, uh, and the Israelites escaped on dry land. Uh, that was another time that Miriam had to do with water. And just three days after the Red Sea had been opened and they went across on dry land, they had no water and they were complaining. Just takes three days, eh? From a great miracle of God until everybody's complaining about God. Us humans can be so very fickle. The interesting thing about the name Miriam is that depending on how you insert the vowels, because uh, I don't know, not many of you might know, but the original text of the Bible, the Old Testament that's written in Hebrew, is without vowels. You have to guess, if you're smart, which vowels go where. That's how it works. So, for instance, if you were to read the newspaper in Hebrew, uh, each Hebrew word could mean many things depending on the adding of the vowels. And if you read it in context, you can understand what it means, and so uh, your brain very quickly has to fill in the vowels. It's like God's name, yud Hey vav Hey. It has no vowels, and so it's difficult to pronounce. How do you pronounce it? But there are uh, uh, vowels. We just uh, are not sure what they are. And so... Her name is a very interesting name because it means three different things. The first meaning of her name is bitter. And so in Numbers 33 verse 8, uh, it says, And they departed from Philaroth and passed through the midst of the sea into the wilderness and went three days' journey in the wilderness of Etham. And uh, there was the three days that I was talking about. And pitched in Marah. Mara means bitter waters. So, in Hebrew, they would have read Miriam waters. Bitter. It's the same um, root word, okay? And folks, what happened with the bitter waters? They had to cast a tree, a branch, into the bitter waters. And if anybody here this morning feels like your life is just bitter waters, it just is horrible to drink. Um, your, your life is like either there's no water or when there is water, it's bitter water. I want to tell you that tree represents Jesus. And when you put Jesus into the mix, you're going to find that the bitterness of your life is going to turn sweet. The second meaning of Miriam's name is to lift up. Okay, so the first one is bitter. The second one is to lift up. And so the people were once again grumbling about no water. And uh, Exodus 17 verse 6. Behold, I will stand before thee uh, upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock. This is God's instruction to Moses. Take your rod and smite the rock. Okay? And there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He took his rod that was from before the presence of God and he hit this rock. And what does the New Testament tell us about this rock? This rock was Jesus. And he smote it and out of it came living waters that could feed hundreds of thousands, even millions of people and all their livestock. That's a lot of water to come out of a rock. I would have loved to have seen that rock. <coughs> but because the Israelites had been complaining, God allowed the Amalekites to attack them. And here the scripture tells us that as long as Moses lifted up his hands, they had victory over the Amalekites. Where does that word lift up come from? It's in the root Hebrew, Miriam. And as long as Moses, Miriam, they had victory. Uh, I don't know if you find that interesting, but I find these sort of things interesting. The third meaning of Miriam is to rebel. 
And once again, the people of Israel were rebelling, or they were Miriam. Interesting. Uh, Numbers 20 verse 8. Take the rod and assemble the congregation, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak unto the rock before their eyes, that it give forth its water. Uh, What did it say? Speak unto the rock. Take your rod that you use to smite the rock, but don't smite the rock. This time I want you to speak to it, and it shall bring forth to them water out of the rock. So shalt thou give the congregation and their cattle drink. (coughs) Did Moses speak to the rock as God told him to? No. He smote the rock. Is it a coincidence that Moses' sister and Jesus' mother had the same name? Could it just be a coincidence? I I tell you, there's nothing that's coincidence in the Bible. If they had the same name, it's because God planned for them to have the same name. And I've been teaching you to look for patterns in the uh, Old and the New Testament. Look for patterns because it's going to teach you something. Did Mary, who was uh, properly called Miriam, experience bitterness and the tree that makes bitter sweet? Did she see Jesus lifted up on the cross and the victory that that brought? Had she experienced the rebelling against her son? The uh, complaints of, isn't he just a carpenter's son? Those three things that Mary's name meant, she all experienced in her lifetime, folks. But Mary sang a song of praise, uh, much like Miriam sang a song of praise in the Old Testament, Mary in the New. And I want to read you these songs of praise this morning because they're so beautiful. Luke 1, 46. And I'm going to read a few verses. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior, for he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He has showed strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent away empty." He hath helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abram, and to his seed forever. What a beautiful prayer that Mary prayed. And then, looking for patterns, Miriam in the Old Testament, Exodus 15, verse 20 and 21. And Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dance. And Miriam answered them, Sing ye to Jehovah, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Where did she get those words from? The Bible teaches us that it's the song of Moses. She was just repeating. She was like the echo of Moses. Moses sang this beautiful song when they came through. But she took it on and she taught the people, let's dance to the song of Moses. So let's continue to uh, read it in Exodus 15 2. Jehovah is my strength and song and he has become my salvation. This is my God and I will praise him. My father's God and I will exalt him. Jehovah is a man of war. Jehovah is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. And his chosen captains are sunk in the Red Sea. The deep covers them. They went down in the depths like a stone. Thy right hand, O Jehovah, is glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Jehovah, dashes in pieces the enemy. And in greatness of thine excellence, thou overthrowest them that rise up against thee. Thou sendest forth thy wrath. It consumes them as stubble. And with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters are piled up. The flood stood upright as a heap. The deeps were 
congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword and my hand shall destroy them. Thou didst blow with thy wind and the sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. Who is like unto thee, O Jehovah among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, faithful in praise, doing wonders? <clears throat> Moses could not enter the promised land, folks, because he struck the rock twice. The first instruction was, strike the rock. It wasn't speak to the rock. It was strike the rock. The second instruction was speak to the rock. Why did Moses strike the rock the second time? And what was the big deal about striking the rock? Well, so what? So he struck the rock. So what, what's important about that? The Bible's not very clear on why Moses struck the rock the second time. So we're going to have to speculate a little bit. Maybe Moses was a bit frustrated with the complaints of all the people. Do you think it could have been that? The people complaining all the time. So the pastor is frustrated and he strikes the rock. Oh my goodness gracious me. Or could it be the fact that his sister had died? Just before that happened, the... Uh, the last thing that the Bible records happening was the death of Miriam. Could it be the grief of his sister that caused him to strike that rock? <clears throat> Folks, this is the rock that followed them through the desert, giving them living waters. Who knows what the name of that rock was? The Hebrew people named it. It's not in the Bible, so don't try and look it up. But uh, it is in the Hebrew Midrash that you can go and see, they named it, and its name was Miriam. Very interesting. They called that rock Miriam. But the rock, folks, for us in the New Testament was a picture of Jesus. The son of Mary, or the son of Miriam, if you want to be more linguistically correct who is the living water, whom if you drink of, you will never thirst again. Jesus himself said it at the water festival. He attended it in Jerusalem. And as the high priest poured the water out as a water sacrifice, Jesus stood and watched it and he said, I am the living water. And he who drinks of that water will never thirst again. <coughs> so let's read in the New Testament, what Moses was guilty of by striking the rock more than once. Hebrews 6, uh, verse 4, 5, and 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the, word to, uh, of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put Him to open shame. That's a powerful scripture. Uh, do you get it? Did you hear what I read? Basically, if I can summarize it for you in more simple English, it's talking to those Christians that get saved, get baptized, get filled with the Holy Spirit, serve God, and then backslide. And then they repent again. It says, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh. It's a mockery of the fact that Jesus died. It's the exact reason why Moses was punished. Because Jesus was only to be struck once. He was only to be crucified once. And yes, Moses was a great leader. Obviously, uh, to whom much has been given, much will be required. And so Moses couldn't just do as he pleased. When he struck that rock the second time, it was like Jesus was being struck 
this, crucified the second time. It was a type. It was a picture that God planned. And now Moses messed up God's picture, and that's why he had to be punished. But the New Testament says, when we continuously come to Jesus and serve Him, and then backslide, and then repent, and then serve Him, it's every time we strike the rock. Every time you crucify. It's not what I think. It's not what I'm saying. It's what Hebrews 6.6 6 says. If they shall fall away, backslide, to renew them again, come back to Christ, unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put Him to open shame. That's what the Bible says, folks. It's exactly when you keep on doing that, you are committing the sin of Moses. The first time Moses struck, it was right because it was the law. The law said that sin had to be punished. The second time Moses struck, it was the works of the flesh. The works of the flesh. And God will have no part in the works of the flesh. <coughs> Folks, there's two main points I want you to take away today. The first is that when we backslide, return to our vomit like a dog will return to its vomit. We commit the sin of Moses. And Moses was excluded from the promised land. That's a serious serious thing. We bring shame on the name of Jesus and on the gospel. I'm full of grace. I'm full of mercy. Why? Because the Holy Spirit dwells in me and He's full of grace and He's full of mercy. But this is a tough word I'm bringing this morning because God is also holy. Yes, He is full of grace, but He wants to warn you that you can't just keep on striking the rock and think that there won't be consequences. There'll come a day where God will say, okay, that is enough. That is enough. The second point that I want to make is without faith you cannot please God. That second strike, the works of the flesh will not cut it for you, my friend. It won't cut it for me and it won't cut it for you. You can try and be goody two-shoes, try and serve God out of your own strength, try and do things right. It doesn't impress God. <clears throat> just come to God just as you are and let Him change you. Let Him fix you. Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, For by grace have you been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. You cannot save yourself. I cannot save myself. We can try and give all our money to the poor. You can donate all your organs to uh, one day when you die to people that need them. You can be Mr. or Mrs. Goody Two Shoes. It doesn't cut it with God. It's the works of the flesh. What cuts it with God is the works of the Spirit. When you allow the Spirit of God to indwell you and to change you so that you become in the very image of Christ Himself, that you become like that rock that gave forth living waters. God wants your life and my life to be a representation of Jesus on the earth that people will find living waters when they connect with us. Let me close with this, folks. Come just as you are to Jesus. Come just as you are. But don't strike the rock again and again and again. Don't fool with the mercy of God. Don't play games with the righteous God. Don't play games with the holy God. <clears throat> None of us are perfect. And folks... I'm not perfect. We all uh, fall. We all sin. We all have to repent. I, I'm not trying to bring a, bring a heavy in that regard. What I am trying to say is that God is holy. And you need to understand that every time you fall back into sin, it's like Moses. You just strike that rod on that rock. It's a disgrace. 
It's a shame. You bring shame on yourself. Won't you stand with me and close your eyes? Lord Jesus, we don't want to be a people that strikes the rock for the second, third, fifth, tenth, hundredth time. We want the Holy Spirit to indwell us and to change us. We want to be more like Jesus. I pray for every person here under the sound of my voice that right now in Jesus' name, the conviction of the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will choose today, 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 I will serve the Lord. I will stop playing with sin. I will stop one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. I'm going to cut it out and I'm going to serve God with all of my heart. I'm going to make the heart of God so happy. I will not continuously commit the sin of Moses by striking the rock, bringing shame to the gospel. God, I pray for this church that we will be a people that will be close to your heart and will bring you much joy. I ask it in Jesus' precious, precious name. Amen and amen. And Lord, now I ask you to cause your face to shine upon your people. I bless the congregation. I pray, Lord, that your face would be upon them with a smile. I pray that you be gracious to these, your people, because you are full of grace, full of mercy. You're a God of mercy. You're a God of grace. Don't let us trample on it, Lord, and bring us your peace, your shalom. Ask it in Jesus' precious name.